strange stories about witches. Is it true what they say? I'm going to bring showrunner out, Lauren Hisrick, and star of the show, Freya Allen. Please give them a very warm round of applause. Go for it. Here you come. I had read the book The Last Wish before Netflix had ever approached me and I really loved it. It's a book of just short stories that follow Geralt as uh, a monster hunter, as a witcher. Um, and there was something really exciting about taking this world that is high fantasy. Um, it obviously has a lot of monsters and it has a lot of magic and it has a lot of fun. But at the core of it are these really grounded characters. Um, and the thing that excited me the most when I went to pitch Netflix is telling the story of Geralt the Witcher but also telling the stories of Ciri and Yennefer, who are big players in the books, but aren't quite given the same introduction as Geralt is. It's interesting because people ask me about the female characters a lot and sort of the, the complications of them, but it's really just what real women are like anyway, right? I mean, it's strong in some circumstances, vulnerable in others, occasionally bold, occasionally bitchy, occasionally silent. To me, what I wanted to capture is these women before they were seen through the lens of anyone else. Um, in the books, all of the characters are met through Geralt. So you get Geralt's impression of them, and then you get to learn to meet them. And I wanted the world to see Ciri who she was first. I wanted to introduce the world to the three of them at the same time and allow them each to really flourish as characters on their own before they ever started meeting or interacting with each other. When I first was pitching to Netflix, I pitched them a completely different version of the story, uh, which I've actually never talked about before. Um, I pitched them a version of the story that actually started with a, the second to last book, which is Lady of the Lake, um, where Ciri sort of ends up <laughs> sitting by a lake, uh, meeting with a man and sort of telling her story. And I'd actually started with that narrative structure, which is to have Ciri be our focal character and be kind of our narrator. The problem was is that I realized as I started writing that version that I wasn't getting enough of Geralt and his perspective because it was all being told through Siri. So it actually took me a while. I went through several versions and then I, I literally had one of those aha moments in the shower and sort of jumped out of the shower <laughs> and said to my husband, like, does this make sense? Um, you know, can I tell all three of these stories at the same time and not have it be too confusing? This particular season skips through a lot of space and time as well. So I think there will be a lot of fun pairings of relationships uh, that some that fans will hopefully really be looking forward to and expecting, and also some new uh, new fun ones. You know, it's it's been interesting because I do think that television audiences are really savvy now, and as a writer, as a creator, we have that on our side. So I think that we do jump through time a lot, um, and we jump back and forth through events and characters that seem dead aren't dead, and, and people come back and you revisit places or revisit stories again. But I think it's an exciting journey for, for fans and for, you know, even audiences that have never seen The Witcher before, because I, I think that they can keep up, you know? I think they're really, really smart and want to be challenged in how they watch television, and I think this can do that. I've heard tales of your kind, Witcher. I thought you'd have fangs or horns or something. I had them filed down. <laughs> You know, basically, when we meet Geralt, he's almost 100 years old already, and he's lived a lot of life. And I wanted to start him in a place where I could, um, an audience could sort of understand what he's gone through, but then immediately challenge him in that first episode and sort of start his, his journey off in a different direction. Um, so I chose a story called The Last Wish, um, which to me sort of puts him up against a character named Renfri and challenges his worldview. So basically we get to meet the Witcher, we get to hear how he, how he exists in the world, what he thinks his role is, how he feels about it, and then we immediately challenge it and, and make him rethink that. And that really starts his journey off. I would say his interactions with Renfri are sort of his emotional touchstone for the entire season, and he comes back pretty often to what happened and the decision that he made. This is Geralt's sort of first run-in with destiny in the show, and it really changes his journey for the entire rest of the season. And also, it's just one of my favorite stories. Renfri is one of my favorite characters as well. So to introduce audiences to sort of this kick-ass uh, female warrior bandit um, and say these are the type of characters that you're going to see in our series and, and they're, they're going to be people that seem bad that are actually good and people who are good that 
or seem good who actually have much more complicated motivations. And I think it's a really good way to present the world of The Witcher to an audience because it, it's morally and ethically gray from the get-go. Just because someone looks good on the outside or may have good intentions doesn't mean that they don't have a darker side inside. And the people that you would typically watch the first season and say, well, oh, obviously that's the villain. It was really important for us to get into his brain and understand why he's doing what he's doing and that he actually thinks he's doing something for the good of the continent. You know, one of the first things that I wanted to do is um, there's a lot of history revealed and sort of um, backstories of characters that are revealed uh, through little lines of dialogue. And it will be Yennefer saying, you know, as a child, this happened. And I thought, well, rather than be told that story, I want to see that story, which is part of the reason we went back in Yen's childhood or part of the reason that we start with Ciri as a princess and talking to her family before she goes out and, and sort of starts her journey in the books. I prefer our audience to evolve with our characters and so that everyone's kind of on the same page and moving forward through stories, not necessarily in a linear fashion, but in, in a way where an audience member understands how this character got from point A to point B emotionally. The big thing that, that I learned on uh, Daredevil and Defenders and Umbrella Academy is about adaptation and about taking something that has a huge fan base and that people really, really love in its existing form and translating it to a new form. Um, and the changes that have to be made between a comic book and television or between a beloved book series and television. You know, I definitely understand that, that people who have been reading these books since they were kids or have read them to their kids, it's really scary to say, oh, we're gonna have someone new come in and just start changing things in this thing that I love. Um, what I will always say is, in general, we add to. We try not to detract from. Um, sometimes we have to leave things out. Again, 4,000 pages of books, only eight hours, you know, to tell a story. So, you know, there's a lot that we have to leave out. When we start inventing new characters, specifically, it's usually just to give our characters someone to talk to. Um, in a book, you don't necessarily have to talk to people. You can have pages and pages of description. Um, when you're on the screen, we can't just get into a character's mind and understand what they're feeling. So we have to give those characters someone to bounce ideas off of. There are entire chapters of the book that are um, Geralt just kind of espousing things. Well, you, you can't just put a character down in a room and have him start telling, you know, monologuing for, you know, six, seven, eight pages. It just doesn't work on screen. Chaos is the most dangerous thing in this world. But without control, chaos will kill you. Obviously, there's a lot of allusions to fairy tales. Um, you know, uh, The Last Wish very much has a Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs thing happening, which is great. Um, there's a story called A Grain of Truth, which is a little bit of a Beauty and the Beast. Um, and a lot of the monsters and characters are drawn directly from Slavic folklore. And that was really important for us to keep and sort of honor. And even as we create new monsters or new characters that aren't in the books to sort of flesh out stories, we actually go back to um, to sort of Polish culture as often as we can. Um, we have a Polish producer, Tomek Baginski, who's amazing and who is my immediate go-to for so many questions about so many things. Um, and sometimes it's just about what, what are the stories that you were told as a kid? What are the ghost stories you were told? What has been passed down through your family? The, the other thing that is unexpected in The Witcher is the, um, the wit and humor. I think fantasy a lot of times is really, really earnest. Um, it's about big sort of life-changing stuff, battles and wars being fought and, you know, people being marginalized and all of those things exist in The Witcher. Um, but at the same time, the, the thing that I connected to most in the books is that you also really get to, you get to know characters who aren't being directly impacted by that battle happening over there. They just have to get up every day and keep their farming going and, and continue to live. And what I love about how real people exist is in the face of tragedy, we often turn to humor. It's our only way to keep going. And the characters do that all the time in The Witcher. And it's a really nice balance, I think because you get to laugh as much as anything else. It's not really depressing to watch at the end of the day. <laughs>So I first met Andre in Poland right after I had sold the series and we sat down and we had a lovely lunch and I sort of picked his brain about who he was and where he'd come from and, and you know, not even so much about what made him write The Witcher. I'm sure he's been asked that question 
a million times, but it was really just sort of trying to understand who he was and who he is in these books. Where is he in these books? Um, and then he came to Budapest where we were shooting. It was amazing. Um, he was really quite taken and uh, he got tears in his eyes several times um, and would bat them away. <laughs> um, I think it was really great for him to sort of, for him to see that we were honoring his vision, you know, so much and sort of bringing to life. And, and I think everyone's always worried too that we're not going to be able to do things justice. And I think he felt very much like we were doing, um, doing his stories justice and making them even more beautiful than he'd anticipated. Um, the best thing that he said to me, um, I was asking him if he had, he, he, if he'd read all the scripts, if he was interested in starting to see early cuts, um, because he basically has access to as much of the material as he wants to. Um, and he said no, because he said, you know, that he thinks of it kind of like the ingredients of a soup. And he said, if you just line up the ingredients for me, um, that's not going to do anything for me. Uh, what I would rather do is taste the soup in the end. And he really wants to, I think he trusts, he trusts what we're doing. He has seen enough to whet his appetite. And now he wants to see what the world is going to see in its fully finished form. And I'm, I'm so excited for him to see it. You will unleash true calamity upon us all. I'll take that chance.